First of all, slight apologies for the delay in videos. It's not normally two weeks between two of my videos. It's just that I've been a little bit ill, but I'm now back on form and hopefully producing more videos than ever. For this video, I thought it'd be fun if we just did two of the hardest GRE quant questions around. For the first question, 85% of people got it wrong. And for the second question, I think it was 89% of students got this wrong. So I thought it would just be fun just to get back into the flow of things by doing two of the hardest GRE quant questions. So don't feel bad if you get it wrong, but hopefully you can learn from these questions. The first question is a probability question, and I'm gonna leave the second question as a surprise, so keep watching. The first question is hopefully on your screen somewhere now, and what it's asking is that there are 20 light bulbs in a box and two of them are defective. If two bulbs are picked simultaneously and at random, what is the probability that neither of them are defective? Now, I have done another video on probability, so do watch that if you want to go into more depth on probability, but for this video, I'm just gonna get straight to it and give you my method for solving a question like this. The first thing to note is that I would use letters to lay out the possibilities that I want. I want my first light bulb to be non-defective. Let's use N for that. And I want my second light bulb to be non-defective. So that's N again. There are no other combinations to consider because there's only one way of having a not defective than a not defective. It's not as if I have to change the order or anything. Now at this point, many of you will be saying to me, but wait, Philip, it said that they would pick these light bulbs simultaneously. Doesn't that make a big difference? No, that is the lesson. If they say simultaneously, you can still treat it as one choice and then another choice. You don't have to worry about the fact that they were chosen simultaneously, you can still think of it as one light bulb being picked and then the next light bulb being picked. So here I'm gonna work out the probability of getting a non-defective light bulb for my first choice. Then, based on that, the chance of getting a non-defective light bulb for my second choice. I am not gonna worry about the fact that they were chosen simultaneously. That does not affect the calculation. Many, many people worry about that, but it's nothing to worry about. The first N shouldn't be too hard. We have two defective light bulbs and 20 light bulbs in total. That means that we have 18 non-defective light bulbs. So that first N is not too bad. The chances of getting a non-defective light bulb would be 18 out of a total of 20. And we can worry about simplifying that later. For now, we can just write 18 over 20. It's that second N, which won't be the same, that's slightly harder. Can you pause the video if you need to, and then tell me what that second N will be? What's the probability that our second light bulb will also be non-defective? It would be 17 out of 19. Why 17? Because after we made that first choice, there are now only 17 non-defective light bulbs left in this box. And therefore, we want to get one of those, so the numerator will be 17. That first choice, that first selection, the 18 over 20, affects our second selection. Once we've chosen that non-defective light bulb for our first choice, there are only 17 left. And it also affects our denominator. There were 20 light bulbs in total in our first choice, but now there are only 19 in total for our second choice. So it's 17 out of 19 as the probability that our second light bulb will also be non-defective, given that we've chosen a non-defective light bulb for our first choice. As I gave away earlier, we're gonna have to multiply those probabilities. Why? Because we want a non-defective light bulb and a non-defective light bulb. An and in probability always means multiply. 
or always means add. So it's going to be multiply. Now, at this final stage, we can think about simplifying, which is not terribly pretty here because 17 and 19 are primes, so we won't be able to simplify those. 18 and 20 could be simplified to 9 over 10, and then we've got a multiplication on our hands, which you would have to work out. You could do that with a calculator if this was the GRE, or of course, without a calculator if it's the GMAT. Thinking about doing that in my head, we've got 9 times 17, which is 90 plus 63, 153, and we've got 20 times 19, which is 380. Oh, sorry, 10 times 19, because we've simplified it. So 10 times 19 is 190. So 153 over 190, I believe. I've done that in my head, but that should be our answer to our first question. 85% of people couldn't do it. Could you do it? And if you couldn't, have you now learned to confidently do these kind of probability questions? I really hope so. Anyway, time for our second question. And here, only 11% of students got this right. And it's a question that involves factorials, which I don't believe this channel has yet really touched on to any great depth. Anyway, here is the question. What is the least positive integer that is not a factor of 25 factorial and not a prime number? Now, let's unpack that a bit. First of all, what is 25 factorial? For those of you who don't know, 25 factorial is 25 multiplied by 24, multiplied by 23, by 22, by 21, all the way down to one. In fact, any factorial is that number multiplied by the integer below it, all the way down to one. For example, 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Now, in another video, I'll explain the significance of factorials and why they were invented. Trust me, they are useful. But for the purposes of this video, we're just going to meditate on 25 factorial and the numbers that are not a factor of 25 factorial, which is the first part of that question. First, let's think about the numbers that are a factor of 25 factorial. All the numbers 25 and below are definitely a factor of 25 factorial. For example, 22 is a factor because we can find the number 22 in that list of integers that we're multiplying. 25 times 24 times 23 times 22. So all the numbers below 25 are, of course, factors of 25 factorial but there are many numbers above 25, hundreds of numbers probably, that are factors of 25 factorial. For example, take the number 50. If we break down 50 into 25 times two, we can find a 25 in 25 factorial, and we can find a two in 25 factorial. And therefore, because we can find all the ingredients inside 50, inside 25 factorial, we can say that 50 is a factor of 25 factorial. Or in other words, 25 factorial is a multiple of 50 because it contains the ingredients that are contained in 50. Or let's take the number 66. Is 66 a factor of 25 factorial. Well, again, let's prime factorize. 66 is 11 times 6, and both 11 and 6 are contained somewhere in 25 factorial. Therefore, yes, again, 66 is a factor of 25 factorial. At this point, you might want to pause the video and think to yourself about the kind of numbers that won't be factors of 25 factorial. In other words, the kind of numbers that can't be found inside 25 factorial. The clue is in the fact that we are prime factorizing these numbers before we check whether they're factors of 25 factorial. So the answer is, to avoid being a factor of 25 factorial, we must have numbers 
that can't be prime factorized down into numbers that are factors of 25 factorial. In other words, we need to find primes that are bigger than 25. Let's take one example. What about the number 31? 31 is a prime number bigger than 25 factorial. So you can't break down or prime factorize 31. It's already a prime. We can't prime factorize it. And therefore 31 is just 31. And you won't be able to find 31 anywhere in 25 factorial. And therefore 31 is not a factor of 25 factorial. But many of you are gonna to say to me at this point, yes, we know that prime numbers bigger than 25 are not factors of 25 factorial, but the question said it cannot be a prime number. Ah, don't we have a problem there? Well, maybe. First of all, let's establish what the least prime number is that is not a factor of 25 factorial, because the question did ask about the least positive integer. The smallest prime number above 25 is 29. 29 is a prime number which is not a factor of 25 factorial for the reasons given earlier. And how can we deal with that problem of the fact that the question said that the number we pick can't be a prime number? Well, the smallest way to make 29 a non-prime number is to multiply it by two. 29 times two is 58 which is itself not a prime number, but it contains that 29, which is not a factor of 25 factorial. And therefore 58 is not a factor of 25 factorial, because when you break down 58, you get 29 times two, and the 29 is not a factor of 25 factorial. And because we pick the smallest prime above 25, which is 29, and we pick the smallest number aside from one to multiply it by, we have now found the smallest integer possible that's neither a prime and neither a factor of 25 factorial, and that would be 58. For those people who found that a little bit too complicated, you did have one alternative method, which is simply to prime factorize each of the answers and see whether the primes involved were factors of 25 factorial. So 26, even though it's not a prime number, if you break it down, it's 13 times two. And both 13 and two are factors of 25 factorial. So 26 is a factor of 25 factorial. And you could go through the answer choices and only 58 wouldn't be a factor of 25 factorial because when you break down 58, you find 29, which is not contained in 25 factorial. Either method would work. The first one's a little bit fancier and quicker. The second one's reliable if you found that a bit too complicated. So I thought it would be fun to go through a couple of really hard questions. If you like this, please leave a like and a comment so I know to do more of these videos. Or if you want me to stick to doing more subject specific videos, I can do that too. Either way, I just thought it'd be fun to come back from my illness break and give you a interesting GRE and GMAT quant video. Hope it helps and have a great day.